Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, Southern Church and welcome to the, uh, can we say second or third uh, session? Probably third session? Yeah, yeah. 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 second night. Second night, third session, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I hope you enjoyed last night and uh, I'm sure Rachel prepared for us something very interesting for tonight as well. So, so far, how do you like the, uh, the, the sessions? Do you like, the, did you learn anything new? And d did you start to practice what you heard last night as well? Yeah, that's good, yeah. Now, Rachel, can you tell us um, like uh, 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 your passion for the, uh, for the health and for your herbalism as well? How does that come from and like, uh, uh, can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so as I shared a little bit last night about my personal testimony about how I needed to look for an alternative outside of modern medicine, because that wasn't providing some answers, but I've also realised a lot, especially in the last couple of years, there's a, there's a thousand voices out there in terms of what's healthy and what's not, and it's been quite hard even for just the general public, let alone doctors as well, to try and sort through all of this information. So. My passion really is to go back to those roots that we've all had about what we can do to restore our health using natural means. You know, we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Our physiology is just extraordinary. Mm. But there are so many wonderful ways that we can restore our health that doesn't require anything drastic, as such as pharmaceutical medicines, you know, surgery. We can do a lot without needing that, even though they have their part to play. So my passion is that, is about using these and teaching others how to use these methods to restore their health. Mm, okay, good. Now, uh, another thing, like, uh, so what did you find, like, uh, your uh, biggest challenge, or do you have, like, a, a still challenge, like, uh, regarding uh, all these, like, uh, seminars and, like, uh, how to approach to the uh, to people and how to uh, uh, in, uh, introduce what you uh, teach them and, yeah? So... Um, it's, it's actually not a big challenge I thought it was going to be, um, but I actually find that, generally speaking, um, Australians are really open mm. to, to listening to uh, aspects that they can, things that they can do for themselves. I always sort of had this uh, sort of understanding that, you know, you have this doctor-patient relationship, it was very prescriptive, I was there to do something and treat them. But I'm finding more and more that people love to be involved in how they treat themselves. They mm. actually want to take control of some of that. Yes, there's still some of the old school where people just say, give me the script, I don't want to have to do anything. But I'm getting more and more people who are more willing to put the effort in and do things for themselves. And I'm happy to teach. Okay, so, that's good, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to take any more time. I know you are ready, you pumped up, be pumped up. So we are ready for tonight and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to let you know too, there are notes available for each of these lectures. Um, I will be emailing them to someone in the church, so if you need a copy of them, obviously you can speak to a member of this um, church organisation here. Um, but yes, so feel free to either approach me or someone and we'll give you a copy of the notes. So today I'm going to be looking at two topics. One is on healing heart disease. So it's a bit more than just your heart, it's your general circulation as well. So we're going to look at some of the aspects here. The second one is looking at healthy weight management, looking at ways to, to lose weight and maintain a healthy weight naturally. So they are somewhat related topics, as you will see as we go through some of these. But let's delve into the heart first. Now, up until recently, heart disease was our biggest killer. So really, that has only just been briefly taken over by cancers and things like that. But heart disease was the biggest killer in our country. Certainly, there's a lot of contributing factors to that. Mostly, they are lifestyle causes. Things that we do to our bodies, what we don't do, the stress that we're under, they're all huge contributing factors to heart disease. So I'm going to have a look at some of the risk factors to start with. Again, most of these won't be anything new, but I'll just list them anyway. So smoking, of course, a big risk factor. Having high cholesterol or particularly other types of bad blood fat, such as triglycerides. Having high blood pressure, certainly a major risk factor. Being overweight or obese is another one. Having high blood sugars or diabetes, again, a major contributor to heart disease. Just having a generally unhealthy diet, which is very common in our Western society. Not getting enough exercise, 
drinking too much alcohol, and then there's a whole range of what I call psychosocial factors, stress, mental illness, isolation, addictions, all of these things are independent risk factors for heart disease. Now let's see what we can do about this. First and foremost, if there's one thing that I could change in anyone's life, this would be the first thing. So for those who are smokers, if I could get them to quit smoking. And we know that if you even just look on the world stage with this one, it's probably one of the largest causes of poor health and death. We know that each year we lose about 20,000 Australians still to smoking. So it's still a significant issue. About 5 million people each year will die around the world from a smoking-related disease. So it is still a huge problem. We know that smoking cigarettes, you have about 70 toxic carcinogens. These are cancer-causing compounds, and they can cause more than 40 different types of cancer. So that's even before we get to the heart disease. But nicotine itself is particularly bad at destabilising or making the rhythm of your heart unstable. So it's not just all of these toxic compounds that cause cancer, there's nicotine as well. So if you have a heart attack and you're a smoker, you are far more likely to die from an abnormal heart rhythm. So that's just with nicotine alone. And then there's the carbon monoxide. So when you're smoking, you have a lot of exposure to that. Um, and this can damage the lining of your blood vessels, of your arteries, and it obviously makes it a lot more easier for blockages to build up, um, causing the, what we call that atherosclerosis, those blockages there that lead to heart attacks and strokes. So it's a whole range of chemicals, too numerous to put them all down in a list, but it's not just the cancer-causing ones, you've got the nicotine and you've got the carbon monoxide as well. So one of the things that I often find difficult when I confront someone with the object of quitting their smoking is that they say, well, I've been smoking forever. It's not going to do me any good to quit now. Why do I bother? There is a reason for that. And so we're going to have a look at some of these things. So almost immediately, when you quit smoking, you'll improve your heart rate and blood pressure. So that's an immediate reaction that you get on the spot. Within a day, the levels of that poisonous carbon monoxide I was talking about in your blob, blood level will drop back to normal and prevent further damaging to the lining of the blood vessels. So that stops within a day. Over the next few months, you'll improve the circulation throughout your whole body. Your lung function will start to increase and get better. Over several months, the lungs will continue to heal. The coughing that was there and the shortness of breath will really start to decline. At one year, your risk of a heart disease is half that of someone who's still smoking. That's just at one year. So if you think about all these people who say, look, it's no, no benefit to doing so, even at one year, their risk is going to be half that of someone who's still smoking. At five years, the risk of a variety of cancers, whether it be the mouth, the esophagus, which is the food pipe, your throat, the bladder, etc., it halves that risk. So it's really, really important that they have a look at that. And it also reduces the risk of stroke as well. At 10 years, your risk of lung cancer is half that of a smoker. And at 15 years, your risk of coronary artery disease, that's heart disease, is the same as that of a non-smoker. So my answer to all of this is it's never too late. And so if you or you have friends that are smoking, encourage them with these sorts of thoughts, that it's never too late to stop smoking. And there certainly are numerous aids that um, GPs can help them with to quit smoking, so always encourage people with that one. So whilst most of us will probably agree that if we have a really healthy life, you know, your diet's really great, you're doing lots of exercise, we can prevent heart disease. But could we actually reverse it? If we have heart disease already, could we do something about reversing that? And the answer is absolutely. And we have really good, strong science to back this one up. There's a cardiologist and researcher in America by the name of Dr. Ornish. You may have heard of him. He's quite famous in his field. He and his team have been studying this very thing. They've looked at the effects of lifestyle on cardiovascular disease, heart disease. More recently, he's also been looking at the same principles and applying them to cancer and dementia as well. 
but he took a group of people who had proven heart disease, they had blockages in their heart, and he did that by looking at what we call an angiogram, where they can light up the blood vessels in your heart and see where the blockages are. So he took these group of people, and he split them into two. He put one group on this really comprehensive lifestyle plan, and that the other group was called a control group. They were left to just do the standard type of thing. So there's a really good comparison between these two groups. So one was obviously getting the lifestyle intervention, the other one was just the usual type of intervention that most people would do. But let's have a look and see what his lifestyle program was. So his diet. It was a whole food, plant-based diet. So this is what we were talking about last night. So you're getting all your whole grains, your fruits, your vegetables, your legumes, etc., in the least processed form that you could and obviously trying to avoid lots of oils. So I'll put down there very, very limited fat intake. The fat that was in their diet was primarily coming from the whole foods that they were eating. So it was a nice, balanced, whole food, plant-based diet. So that was really important. He said no caffeine, and we'll come back to this one why he did that. He also did very restricted alcohol. There was only a tiny amount allowed. Interestingly, he did not restrict the number of calories. So even though he gave them this plan, this lifestyle plan, he didn't say you have to have a certain number of calories. There was no restriction. The only restriction was to stick to that dietary plan of a whole food plant-based diet with no caffeine and very, very limited alcohol. What else did he do? He looked at stress management. This is another key factor in heart disease. So he really made sure there that they had good stress management and he had some interventional stuff for them as well. He made sure they had very good social and emotional support. So if when, that was, when, when the individual had difficulties there, he helped to provide that. So that was another really important one. And he got them to exercise. And it was just a half hour a day walk. So we're not talking anything too drastic, but that was the summary of his plan of what he did. So what happened? Well, not surprisingly, the group that didn't have any particular lifestyle intervention, they just tended to get worse. They went from where they were to just gradually getting worse with time. The blockages in their heart started to increase. However, the group that was treated, even at one year, showed significant improvements with actual reversal of some of those blockages. And as they followed them over the few years after that, the untreated will continue to get worse the treatment group went from strength to strength. Not only did the blockages continue to improve, there was a 300% improvement in the blood flow to the heart. They were reversing their heart disease. So he sort of summarised with all of this, obviously, you know, you eat that diet, that much better diet, you move more, you stress less, and you stay connected with others. That was his summary of all of that. So even though that might look quite restrictive for some people, remember you are restoring your health here. You're going back to where you want to go. So whilst it might be dramatic, sometimes we need to use dramatic measures to go back. I would much prefer to do that than to go on a, a whole host of extra pharmaceutical medications, have surgery, and potentially still not have the outcome that you want. So this is a much healthier way to do it to reverse your heart disease. So let's just have a look at some of this. We'll break it down a bit. So we'll look at some of the benefits of a plant-based diet and what the studies have shown. Now we know that obviously high blood sugar and diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease. They had something called a diabetes prevention program trial and they showed, this is what they showed here, that a lacto-ovo vegetarian, now what do I mean by that? These are vegetarians who are still continuing to eat dairy and eggs. So they're not purely plant-based, but they still include some dairy eggs, dairy and eggs. And they reduce their risk of developing diabetes by about 60%. However, if they went completely plant-based, they removed the eggs and dairy out of there, they could reduce that risk by about 80%. So we know from this study alone that the lifestyle modifications, those positive changes they made there, is twice as effective as the leading diabetes medication that we have on the market. Twice as effective just by making those lifestyle changes. So that's a really important way to look at those things there as well. What about blood pressure? Well, we know the researchers show the more plant-based your diet is, the closer you get back to that whole food plant-based diet, the greater your drop in blood pressure. 
Vegans, those who have a completely plant-based diet on average, will have a lower blood pressure than the lacto-over-vegetarian, so the, the plant-based eaters who are still including the eggs and dairy. Meat eaters will always have the highest rates of elevated blood pressure and the greatest need for blood pressure medication. So that is very clear in the research as well. It was interesting that even in the first two weeks of being on a whole food plant-based diet, blood pressure can significantly drop just in within two weeks. So it clearly has lots of beautiful anti-inflammatory properties there to bring that blood pressure down. What about cholesterol? Cholesterol is another one that responds beautifully to this diet. Um, there's other types of bad blood fats as well, and it will respond to this diet as well. But there was, we talked yesterday about that uh, gentleman, Colin T. Campbell, um, author of the China study. He um, talked about the effects of protein and cancer, animal proteins in particular, and cancer. But he actually did a comparison of the diet in rural China to those in the United States. So he had these two groups. The Americans had twice the fat, 10 times the meat consumption, and only one third of the fiber when he compared that to the Chinese. And their cholesterol readings were almost 40% higher in the US. But then he did something more interesting. He actually looked at the rates of heart disease. In the US, the men were 16 times more likely, and the, U the women were five times more likely to die from heart disease. That's huge. That's numbers that are just out of this world. So in many non-Western civilizations, we do find that where the diets are mostly plant-based, heart disease is almost non-existent. So we do know diet is really front and center in terms of lifestyle management for heart disease. But on average, a lacto-over-vegetarian, those who are continuing to eat eggs and dairy, will still have cholesterol levels about 20% lower than the meat eater when you go vegan and fully plant-based, then you're going to go to about 40% lower. I just want to point out too, by the way, having a low-fat diet but still staying a vegetarian with your low-fat dairies and things like that doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. The reason is it's because it's not necessarily the fat that's pushing up the cholesterol. The protein found in milk can also push up the cholesterol. So it's not just a fat issue, it's also the protein found there as well. So just an interesting observation. So obviously the benefits of the whole food plant-based diet have um, a much greater effect on weight loss as well, and we will be addressing some of those issues in the next talk. So what about caffeine? Caffeine from coffee, tea, and a variety of other beverages that are now on the market. We do know that caffeine will have significant negative effects on the cardiovascular system. So in a lot of places in the world now, if you've got heart disease, the recommendation is to stop drinking caffeinated beverages. Now, we know it can raise your blood pressure. It can cause palpitation or extra beats in the heart there. It can also make your blood vessels a lot stiffer. And over time, of course, that constriction in the body, in the heart, in the brain will also contribute to your likelihood of having heart attacks and strokes and those sorts of things. It also is linked to higher cholesterol in and of itself as well. So it can do that as well. So again, we've got lots of good reasons. So there's the benefits. You'll have better blood pressure control, better cholesterol levels, and a decreased heart attack risk. Now, this is also true of alcohol. Even at the time that you are drinking a, you know, a glass of alcohol, both your heart rate and blood pressure will go up. In the long term, that will lead to uh, high blood pressure that will stay up, increased heart rate, and it also causes the heart muscle to weaken. And it's the third leading cause of heart disease, is alcoholic heart disease. It causes a lot of weakness in that muscle of the heart. It also causes a rise in the blood fats, particularly one called triglycerides, which is really bad for you. So if you take the alcohol out of the diet, you're gonna get those same benefits. Now, I do know that lots of people talk about the antioxidants that you find in red wine, for instance, but you'd be far better off getting those antioxidants from the red grape itself, or even blueberries. You're gonna get the same benefit without having the adverse reaction of using alcohol. Managing stress. This is a huge one. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do here is just give you a bit of a list of things that you can do to manage your stress. This is not comprehensive. It's just some things that I use with my patients to help them with that. 
but we do know that mental illness and stress have a very complex relationship with heart disease and it's quite frequently neglected. We know that long-term stress will increase what we call cortisol. It's a hormone in our body that in turn will increase your cholesterol and other blood fats, increases your blood pressure, increases your blood sugar. So all of these things are really important to address so we can keep those cortisol levels normal. And we know that both stress and mental illness often lead into heart disease as well. So not only do they, it's sort of a, a bit of a chicken and egg, but sometimes it precedes the, the actual heart disease. So definitely there's a, an effect there coming from stress. So what can we do? Exercise. Exercise is a fantastic way to de-stress. In and of itself, it's got other benefits, and we'll come back to that, but it's beautiful for bringing down that cortisol and, and obviously improving our stress levels. Relaxation therapy. Now, that's as broad as you can make it. For some people, it might be using music, either playing it or listening to it. For others, there might be other things that bring them relaxation. Whatever that might be for you, whatever it is that relaxes you, include that as part of your daily regime. Be expressive. Use your creative, creativeness. So if you are musical, play. If you love to do crafts or some other activity, whatever it might be that is creative in your world, embrace that. It's a really good way to de-stress as well. Spiritual and religious activities, having an active spiritual life is actually been shown to be a fantastic way of reducing your stress. Volunteer for meaningful causes. What I mean here is give back. Do something that's giving back to others without expecting anything in return. It has a really rewarding response in your system. It is very, very good at reducing stress. And there is something nice about doing that as well. But it is very good, a good, great way to, to manage your stress. Spend time in nature. We talked a little bit about what we called forest bathing yesterday, where we walked amongst the trees. One of the things that they did find was not only did it improve your immune system, it also improved the stress levels. So you know, those cortisol levels drop down as well. So get out in nature, spend some time there as often as you can. Massage, that's a beautiful one. If you can get one of those a couple of times a week, I highly recommend it. And obviously make sure you have good, strong social supports. Isolation and you know, not being able to meet with family and friends, it's all a part of being uh, in that stress response. So you want to make sure you have good connections with people. It doesn't have to be a lot. As long as you can have a few friends or family that you've got good connections with, really important for stress management. But as I said, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a few things that I do to help people with that, but there's plenty of others. Now, exercise. We did talk about the benefit for stress, but let's have a look at some things and the benefits it has. I know that globally, the Western societies, we've become more and more sedentary, but we need to get back to some of our exercise. So, number one, it does improve a whole range of those blood fats. It'll improve them significantly. It will reduce your blood pressure, and the more, you know, the more stamina you build, the better that will be. Definitely has an improvement on your blood sugars and decreasing that risk for both diabetes and heart disease. Definitely will improve that blood flow through the heart muscle. It even helps to prevent clots and abnormal heart rhythms. Overall, it will reduce your risk by heart, of heart disease by 30%. Even if you do nothing else, it will reduce your risk of heart disease by 30%. Now, they did this thing called a meta-analysis. Basically, they looked, did a large study and looked at it across a range of um, research, and it was about 340,000 people in this meta-analysis. They found that exercise was as good as medication at preventing both heart disease and prediabetes. So exercise alone was as good as medication. So that's how important that one is as well. A couple of tips that I usually share with my patients, so I'm going to share with you today. Just, I know how hard exercise is. If there's one thing that's probably the hardest to implement, this would be it. Outside of addictions, I do agree giving up smoking is a very hard thing to do, but implementing a regular exercise regime is extremely hard. So here's some tips. Only need to do half an hour a day. It doesn't have to be anything too strenuous. Find someone to do it with. Someone who can be your accountability partner, whether it's a family member or a friend. It doesn't have to be a whole group, just one other person. Obviously, if it's in a group, it sometimes can be a bit easier. But use that method so that you're accountable. When, if there's one morning that you get up and you don't feel like going, 
the person who's doing it with you will be at your door knocking on your door and vice versa. So it will keep you accountable. So do it with somebody. Choose more than one type of exercise. This is particularly important for the boredom factor. Sometimes doing the same thing over and over again does get a bit tedious. It's also important in terms of weight loss as well, choosing different types of exercise so your, your metabolism can shift in different directions. So it's a really important one to consider. The other one I re always remind people to set realistic goals. If you haven't exercised for a very long period of time, you're not going to have the stamina to go out there and run for half an hour. So start low and go slow. Even if it starts with 10 minutes, do something for 10 minutes that's going to make you huff and puff and maybe work up over a few weeks to get to that half an hour time period. But that's just how you would do it if you haven't done it before. But if you've been exercising for a long time, by all means, go for it. Now, my next favourite part, of course, is the herbs and supplements. So I'm going to go through a few of these and, we're, and some natural ways we can get these. Now, the first on the list is probably one that most of us have heard about in terms of heart disease, and that's the omega-3. So lots of evidence around this in terms of maintaining healthy blood pressure, supporting healthy blood fats, reducing overall your risk of heart disease. Really healthy plant-based versions of omega-3 would include your linseed or flaxseed, um, your walnuts, your chia seeds, for example. So there's some great sources of omega-3 there. Magnesium, again, this is one that's really important in terms of blood pressure regulation, but it's also really good for blood sugars and blood fat regulation as well. So it's a really nice one to throw in there. If you did supplements, you probably only need about three or 400 milligrams a day, but some really good sources are all your leafy greens, your oats, your legumes, um, and even some of the nuts such as almonds or Brazil nuts are a good source of magnesium. Olive leaf extract, now this has been shown to lower blood pressure and also help with blood fat, so you, can, you may like to try that one. Hawthorn berry, now this is one of my absolute favourites. It has a really long history of use in Europe. Hundreds and hundreds of years they've been using this herb and it's probably an all-rounder heart tonic, we would call this one. And I'm just going to give you a list of some of the things it's been shown to do. It will improve blood flow through the coronary blood vessels, the heart blood vessels there. It'll improve the contraction of the heart muscle. It will protect your heart muscle from damage when you, if you have a heart attack. It also helps with any abnormal rhythms in your heart. It's also been shown to help lower blood pressure and cholesterol. So you can see why it's been considered an overall heart tonic. It has a kind of a plethora of responses here. So that's a really nice one that I tend to add in with anybody who may have some underlying heart disease. It may interact with some medications, particularly if you're on blood pressure medications, but it's quite easy to monitor that. So by all means, give that a try in conjunction with your local GP. Now, ginkgo biloba. Now, this is a herb that improves circulation. We, you may have heard it um, used for memory, and we'll actually talk about this in a talk later in this week. But its purpose is to improve the circulation. So not only does it improve the circulation in your brain, it can also improve the circulation in your peripheries, so in your hands and your feet, and also in your heart. So it does have some nice protective effects there. Um, it can potentially interact with any some medications, including blood thinners. So take that one with some precaution. Of course, always consult your local doctor. The next one on that list is one called coenzyme Q10, or a more active form of it called ubiquinol. Now, if you are over the age of about 60, 65, I would suggest using the ubiquinol form rather than the coenzyme Q10, because you uh, have a lot more difficulty using, you're utilizing the coenzyme Q10. You'll get a much better response from ubiquinol if you're using it as, as a supplement. But this one's really good at helping with those healthy blood fats um, and also with blood pressure management. It also really helps with fatigue as well. You can find this naturally in whole grains though, so if you prefer not to supplement, that's what you could use. Now, the last one I've got on that list is vitamin K2. Now, it is something that we don't often have a lot of. We get a lot of K1 from our leafy greens, which we can convert a little bit of that into our K2, but the actual vitamin K2 is actually quite hard to find in our diet. There is some Japanese foods that, the, the nata, which is a fermented food, which you can find it in, but generally speaking, you will have to supplement if you decide to use this one. But it has been shown to reduce calcification, hardening of those arteries by about 50%, 
reduces your overall heart disease risk by about 50% and all-cause mortality, so all causes of death by about 25%. So this is a really beautiful um, vitamin if you can get some. I usually would recommend about 90 to 120 milligrams a day. Um, if you are on blood thinners, you can't take it. So particularly warfarin, for example, you won't be able to use this one because it does interact with that. But vitamin K2 is a relatively new kid on the block, but it has some really good responses there. Now some helpful foods. This one often comes up. Garlic, of course, and actually the whole allium family, which includes obviously onions as well, leeks and all those sorts of things. Um, really good at helping with that atherosclerosis or the buildup of fat on the blood, blood vessels. It will lower the blood fat overall. Um, it also helps to lower blood pressure and thin the blood as well. In fact, I did have one patient who used garlic and quite a lot of it um, and came in with very low blood pressure and I had to take her off her medication because it worked too well for her. All right, globe artichoke, and here we're not talking so much about the flower, but rather the leaves here. Um, really promising uh, results with lowering cholesterol. So if you're growing those, don't throw out the leaves, use them. Now the bergamot orange, it's an interesting one. They do grow this over in Europe, and it was an Australian cardiologist who actually has done a fair bit of research on this one. But basically, it, it has a number of wonderful aspects in terms of um, what it does for the heart. It's a bit of a metabolic switch, they would call. It helps to break down sugars and fats. Um, it also improves circulation through your very small blood vessels. Um, it helps to convert some of the, the, the bad type of fats into good type of fat, so it's really good with that. Protects against a fatty liver. So fatty liver is another thing that's really common in our society at the moment that can lead to liver cirrhosis. It protects against that. It also helps to block some of the absorption of cholesterol from our diet that's going into our, car, our gut. So if you can get one of these, you can get the juice or the rind of that, you can use this, of course, to um, help with those things. Now, lots of those nuts, your almonds, your Brazil, your macadamias um, are really good at helping with uh, cholesterol. And the legumes, soybeans, kidney beans, etc., are very good at helping with those blood fats as well. So beans are truly good for the heart, as the old saying goes. Now, just briefly, I would like to say, in terms of screening, so if you are perfectly healthy and you don't think you have any heart risk at all, I do still suggest by the time you're about age 45 or 50, you, get, you do get an assessment. You go to your doctor, and we'll do this approximately every two years or so after that age, and we can assess your risk based on a number of factors, so your age, of course, your gender, whether you're male or female, and whether or not you smoke, your blood fat levels, which you have a blood test to do for that, your blood pressure reading, whether or not you have diabetes and your family history. And we can actually do a risk evaluation. We can actually calculate your risk over the next five years, your chances of having any sort of adverse outcome from any heart, possible heart disease. So I encourage you to do that if you're over that age. Um, and then that way you'll be able to know whether you need to change any of your lifestyle factors. And that is the end of my first talk. Is there any questions? Okay, so there's other factors, of course, and one of the biggest things that you can have a look there is stress. Stress is one of the biggest factors, even though if you're doing the perfect thing with your diet and doing all the right things with exercise, you may have to look at other ways to manage the stress other than just, other than just exercise. Um, in terms of managing the blood pressure, there are certainly some of those herbs that you can, you can include. You just have to monitor your response to that in conjunction. So I wouldn't, for instance, take people off blood pressure medications. Rather, you would start the herbs and include them in and just monitor the blood pressure and see how it goes. And if it starts to come down, of course, then you can start to reduce the um, blood pressure tablets. But yeah, you would never go sort of holus bolus, straight off tablets onto herbs. You would certainly do it a nice, gentle pattern. Uh, what, what is the cause of uh, arrhythmia? What, what are main causes for arrhythmia? 
of harm? Yeah, so there, there are a number of causes. So certainly one of the biggest causes, of, of course, is to have a heart attack. So if you've got damage to your heart, you're much more likely to, to develop um, a, an arrhythmia or an abnormal rhythm of your heart. But certainly alcohol is a big one. Alcohol is a, one of the major causes of arrhythmias as well. But certainly, you know, there's lots of lifestyle factors involved with that. But yes, all of it, it does accumulate into the possibility of that. Oh, is I don't, I don't know the percentage. Um, I mean, roughly, is it, is it uh, a lot of cases hereditary, or uh, is it a very a rare case that it's hereditary? It's more like a, yeah, it's a it's actually far more likely to be related. So, if you look at some of the data in terms of how much chronic disease is hereditary, they probably think close to less than three percent. More than ninety-five percent of the chronic diseases is related to lifestyle choices. So, yeah, genetics, it does play a role, don't get me wrong, and some, some children are born with, you know, significant, you know, problems, so it definitely does play a role. But even with cancers as well, in terms of hereditary, we, we do focus a fair bit on, on genetics, but in actual fact, lifestyle is, it far outweighs any, any response from your genetics. And the key thing that we have to remember too here is that we often think our genes are static with what we're born is what we've got. Whilst that may be true, not all genes are expressed. Not all of them come to fruition in terms of what they do. And we can use lifestyle to keep the bad genes suppressed, if you will, or keep them turned off. So, and sometimes there are things in our lifestyle that we can switch those genes on, those bad genes on. So we do know that genes are no longer considered a static thing, but quite dynamic, and they interact with our choices, our lifestyle choices. So that's why I say it's not necessarily genetics that's causing it, even though those genes may be activated, it's usually the lifestyle factors that have led to those. Hello. Um, Mary Safranco asked the question, mm -hmm. and she's asked, is taking apricot kernels all right? What are the benefits, if so, and how many and how often? Uh, apricot kernels can be quite toxic. So um, I do know that some people do use them in terms of managing cancer. I am not a supporter of this. Um, I think there are much safer ways to do it. There are certain quite dangerous chemicals in, found in apricot kernels themselves, and it's quite difficult to, difficult to regulate the amounts of that. So no, I don't support the use of apricot kernels, generally speaking. I was just wanting to know whether um, beetroot juice is beneficial for circulation in the blood. A beetroot juice and its benefits, it is a fantastic juice to add to a vegetable blend. So it does, look, I wouldn't say it, in, you know, and completely improves the circulation, but it is a very much an alkalining vegetable. It's a vegetable that will improve inflammation, so there'll be certainly some indirect effects on circulation, absolutely. So it's a nice cleansing vegetable, it's a nice alkalining vegetable, it goes really, really well with your carrot and your celery, your green apples, those sorts of things, as a really healthy juice. Yeah. Um, with blood pressure, uh, how much does uh, dehydration have an effect on blood pressure? And if we are reasonably well hydrated, is or it's, that should be a benefit, I'd say. Oh, absolutely. And like I haven't specifically put it in this talk, but um, the the usual calculation for adequate hydration of a, a, a normal sized person is about 30 mils per kilo per day. Um, if you're a very active person, you would have to push that up to 40. So it, on an average sort of 70 kilo person, and we're not all average, but if you had to average it out, that would equate to about 2.1 litres or 2 litres. So yes, absolutely, water is essential. But if you think about the concept of just how thick our blood is as well, if you've got little blockages in your circulation and your blood is not flowing well because you're dehydrated, you're going to be far more likely to develop those clots or develop those blockages. So in and of itself, it's a fantastic way to keep your blood flowing a lot more freely. So absolutely, it's important. All right. 
Fantastic, guys. I know it's warm in here, and I don't want you to all fall asleep, so get up, walk around for five to ten minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about weight management.
Okay, let's get on the seats uh, with a fourth session. So just a, a couple announcements. So uh, uh, the first one, uh, at the end of the session, when you, if you want to ask something, Rachel, please wait for the microphone because everything is going online and people who are looking uh, or watch online uh, session, they want to hear the questions as well. So just wait for Mia or whoever brings the microphone to, uh, to get the microphone. The next thing, uh, all these uh, uh, sessions, uh, uh, Rachel is going to send me an email uh, with all uh, contents, uh, whatever it is. So uh, if you want to have it, uh, please let me know, and I'm going to uh, send you an email, or if you want to have a hard copy, I can print it for you. So please do so. Yeah. Okay, Rachel, your time. All right, so lots of people really, really wait for this talk. So obviously we know that it's a very relevant thing to our current society. And we, when we know with Australia, we are really in somewhat of a crisis at the moment when it comes to our weight. And I know, look, many of us have struggled with our weight at some point in our life, so this is very relevant for most of us. And I also know that there's a thousand diets out there, a thousand ways that you can potentially lose weight. So let me just say I've sorted through so many of these things. In the last 20 years, I've also had patients experience many of these different things so I can talk with some you know, evidence behind what I'm saying, but also knowing what doesn't work for my patients and what doesn't work long term. So, but I want to give you the natural ways, the safe ways that you can do it um, with obviously out harming yourself and also making a healthier you, not just a lighter you. So what do we like in Australia at the moment? This may not come as much of a surprise. About one in four children, so about 25% of our children are either overweight or obese. If you break that down, it's about 10% of children will fall in the obese category. The rest of them are in that overweight category. And it was pretty equal between boys and girls. Two out of every three adults. Okay, so that's a lot. So about 67% of adults in Australia are either overweight or obese. So that's, that is a huge thing. We have about 36 or so percent in the overweight range and about 31% in the obese range, so almost equal there. In adults, men do, uh, uh, there's more men than women who are in that range as well. By the way, these numbers were calculated back three years ago. They haven't released the latest one, but they're suspecting we're probably closer to about 70%. We haven't reached the plateau yet in terms of this nation's weight. And we do know just in the last decade that our obesity rate has doubled. So it's still going up, still causing a lot of trouble. And that's our financial cost. From three years ago, it's costing our nation about $12 billion every year as a direct and indirect cost to our economy. And we also know that we lose about 140 million, 100, sorry, 140 million, we lose about 140 Australians every day from diseases related to obesity. So if you look at the numbers who are dying from COVID and or other related things, just remember we lose 140 Aussies every day from obesity related diseases. So what are the two drivers? There's two major reasons that we are getting more and more obese. This is no surprise to us. We don't move, okay? We're losing our, we're declining in our physical activity. Um, if you look at what we were like now compared to 100 years ago, we are far more sedentary. We are just not moving as much as we should. And look, there's a number of reasons. If, even if you look at the way, you know, our modes of transportation, we just go everywhere, don't we? In cars, we don't walk, we don't ride, we don't, we don't use exercise as our form of way of getting around. And one of the things they looked at 100 years ago, our ancestors, and this is both children and adults, were using somewhere up to three to five times more energy than we are now. They were moving that much, they were using three to five times more energy. So this is one of the reasons why we're becoming obese. And the other one, of course, is the type of foods we're eating. So we've got the wrong type of foods. These are very energy dense foods, like lots of calories within a very small packaged food. Highly processed, that's another important one. Um, lots of animal fats, lots of refined sugars. So that's another reason. And look, it, it, for good reason we're consuming these foods is because we are a very busy nation as well. So we often will 
will go to things that are quick to use, quick to cook, but unfortunately they're not the healthy things. So let's define obesity, and we can do this in a couple of ways. So most of you have probably heard about BMI, that stands for Body Mass Index, and that is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in metres squared. So that's how they calculate it. Now, if you're between about 18 and a half to 25, you're in the healthy range. If you're over sort of 25 to 30, you're sitting in the overweight range, and then you get to the 30 and over, and that's in the obese range. They've got a bit of a breakdown over there for morbid obesity as well. But generally speaking, you want to get to that 25 or below if you can. But there are limitations to this one. So it's not always the best way to, to measure this because it won't distinguish between fat and muscle. So for instance, people who are athletes or certain ethnic groups or those with disabilities, we can't use this measurement. So there is another one, and that is your waist circumference, and it's often a better one to use. And there's some numbers there that we can use. Now what this is actually measuring is your visceral fat. This is the bad kind of fat that sits around your chest and abdomen. Now we want to measure this one somewhere between the hip and the top of your rib bottom of your rib cage here, about halfway there. And you don't measure it by sucking in your breath and taking a tight measurement. You sit relaxed and let the measuring tape sit nice and easy there. And that will give you your numbers. So if you ask, we want to sort of basically have a look at numbers. We say in women, less than 80 centimetres around that um, waist measurement there. For men, about less than 93, 92 centimetres. So, that will give you your, in terms of reduce your risk of a number of different chronic diseases, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now, I've got a picture of two hearts here, one very healthy heart and one very unhealthy heart. What I'm actually showing you here is that build-up of what I called before the visceral fat, the bad kind of fat. So you can see the heart there with all that yellow fat around it. That's what happens when you're building up fat around the middle here. That fat also gets attached to all of the other organs through your abdomen as well. So it's not just the heart. And the reason this one is so bad is it's quite toxic and inflammatory. It releases a number of chemicals and hormones that are really inflammatory to the organs. So we know what this has done so far. We have seen that it, it reduces your ability to be sensitive to insulin. So you're far more likely to develop diabetes. It will stimulate uncontrolled growth of some cells, so you'll end up more likely to develop cancers. It can interfere with the body fluid balance. It can promote atherosclerosis, or the buildup of those fats in your arteries. It can disrupt the electrical activity in your heart and cause rhythm problems in the heart as well. But overall, it will promote inflammation in the whole body, just a chronic low-grade inflammation. So not just around the organs, but elsewhere, it causes a low-grade inflammation and a chronic one. So that visceral fat, even though I'm showing you just one organ, it builds up right through the chest cavity and through the abdominal cavity when you're overweight. The good news is that we can actually lose this visceral fat. It's not an absolute once it's there, you can't get rid of it. And I've got a picture there of sort of like a, a cut section through a body. And the red that you see in the screen is that visceral fat. So you can see a before and after um, lifestyle measures that have been put in place. And somebody's been able to lose a fair bit of that red visceral fat in their abdomen. So let's have a look at some of the chronic diseases that are associated with obesity. So these are things that are directly linked to obesity. So people who are overweight are two and a half times more likely to develop heart disease than those who are normal weight. It will certainly increase your risk of stroke. It will double your risk of stroke, in fact. It will cause high blood pressure. So nearly 80% of cases of high blood pressure in men and about 65% in women, it is attributable directly to being overweight. And I often will tell my patients just a 5% drop in your weight will bring down your blood pressure significantly. So it doesn't take a lot to start bringing that back down. Diabetes, definitely a huge factor here. In fact, obese people are 80 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than type 2 diabetes compared to thin, thin people. And here I'm talking about the diabetes that's related to diet and lifestyle. I'm not talking about the one that appears in children or young adults and they need insulin straight up. So a completely different type of diabetes. 
Cancer, being overweight or obese increases the risk of a variety of cancers. Bowel, breast, uh, the food pipe, the esophageal cancer, stomach, gallbladder, kidney, liver, pancreas, thyroid, ovarian and uterine cancer, all increase your chances of that. And if we learnt before about that toxic visceral fat and how it causes chronic inflammation, it is no surprise that those organs, when they're chronically inflamed, are far more likely to develop cancers. Arthritis. You know, obviously, this is where your joints are being overloaded. They're being worn out a lot more quickly. So you will develop arthritis, much more likely to develop arthritis as a result of that. Liver disease. Now, we know that obesity is associated with the development of something called fatty liver. Um, that can then lead to liver cirrhosis, which causes failure of the liver. So it's not a benign condition. It is something that's quite toxic to the liver, and over time, it can develop that. But it can be reversed. Gallbladder disease, and that's particularly the gallstones, and they often actually have the foundation in cholesterol. The stone is made up of cholesterol, so definitely an issue with uh, weight gain. Kidney disease. So even the poor kidneys don't get a chance here. They have to work a lot harder and do their job a lot longer, um, and certainly heightens your risk of chronic kidney disease. Sleep apnea. So obviously with a build-up of extra tissue around the neck, um, it will increase your likelihood of developing obstruction while you're asleep, and this alone causes a whole host of other issues, including blood pressure issues as well. But certainly it's associated with obesity. And lastly, obesity increases your risk of developing depression. So even your mental health here has a, another important interaction. Okay, does anybody know what this spider is? It's a rather mean looking one, isn't it? And I'm gonna introduce you something called the pleasure trap. So what we have here is the black widow spider. So the bigger one that you see on the screen there is the female. The littler one is the, is the male. So this is a story of the black widow spider. And it's a very strange dance that goes on between these two here. So obviously they're gonna need to mate to keep the species going. So you have the male spider coming along. Now he sees this giant female. Now he's driven to go there to mate, but he looks at the female and says, oh, that doesn't look so good. So you see him kind of darting backwards and forward. He's not quite sure. Does he go, you know, you got the whole thing that I need to, you know, bring driven here, you know, the pleasure instinct, I've got to go. But he's also got the fear instinct, the protection instinct as well. Eventually, however, almost always, the male ends up there. They mate. Um, however, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> Another thing that we are all driven to do is conserve energy. So the female sees a really uh, easy meal in front of her. So she quickly hunts down the male as he uh, backs away and he becomes her next meal. But there's a few things going on here. And I guess there's, there's a three motivational forces, I would call that. Um, you have your seeking pleasure there, you have your avoiding pain, you have your conserving energy. And those three things are constantly in, in sort of our mind when we're looking at um, going forward with anything. So these motivational forces were described by a couple of doctors, Dr. Lyle and Goldhammer in the US, and it's interesting in how it interacts with us and our interaction with food. And I'll show you some things here. So this is the work that was done by these two doctors. So phase one there, where that number one is, this is where you're eating a very nice, healthy diet. It's a whole food diet, lots of natural, unprocessed foods, low calorie density, so your food hasn't got lots of calories in a small amount of food, and you have this normal pleasure response to food. So you, you, you feel good when you eat. There's no sort of heightened or low. It's a nice, pleasurable response. Then you've got phase two, and this happens when you are exposed to foods that are very dense, and it causes this extra burst of pleasure. So we're talking chocolate here, we're talking pizza, chips, burgers, really high fatty foods, ice cream, anything that's very calorie dense. And it fires off the pleasure centers in your brain a lot higher, so that's why you get that peak in that, in that graph there, you go up to number two. Now just remember there's a couple of factors going on here, it's not just the pleasure side of it, but if you think about the fact that it's conserving your energy to have these foods, if you heat up a single slice of pizza, for instance, you basically just get a pizza, pizza that's already been made, you throw it in the microwave. That's all the energy you've expended, and you're going to get about 300 calories out of that piece of pizza. 
If, however, you had to pre prepare an equal amount in terms of weight of like a green salad, there's lots of chopping up to do, you're expending a bit of energy, but you only get about 20 calories from that. So there's that driver as well. You've got 300 calories from a pizza, you've got 20 from an equal weight of green salad. So your body's kind of naturally going to gravitate towards that. So that's that number two. But then you kind of feel a bit guilty and you think it's time to go back to having a good diet. So what do you think happens? That pleasure thing goes down to, where, to below where it should be. So you start ending going into that number four there. So this is the point where you just really... And by the way, if you keep eating the foods at that high level, your pleasure will actually drop back down into normal. Even though you're eating those high pleasure foods, it will just keep driving it there. And you'll often get more and more of those foods to try and drive that pleasure up. But anyway, you're back to a normal diet, you're eating foods that you should be eating, and suddenly it's no longer pleasurable. It's actually subnormal pleasures that, that you're getting out of it. So that's one of the things that it makes it more and more difficult to drive us to eat these healthy foods when we've got all of these unhealthy things that are driving these pleasure responses. If, however, you stay on your healthy diet, it only takes a few weeks to even maybe just a couple of months for us to get back to that normal pleasure response indefinitely. So it does drive it back up to that level on that number five there, just by staying on just for a couple of weeks to a couple of months. So it doesn't take long at all to have that response back to normal. But it is a very vicious cycle. And I probably would add in here, it's not just the calorie density of the food. There are, there are whole companies around the world that produce chemicals for our food to keep us addicted. So a lot of these processed foods have some very nasty addictive chemicals in them so that will drive that pleasure up and keep us addicted. So even if it's not calorie dense, sometimes it's the chemicals in it that are driving that pleasure centre. So with that in mind, part of our weight loss lifestyle, there's some things that we need to do to manage our mindset, some things that we need to think about when we're going making changes. So the first thing is don't get caught in that pleasure trap or at least recognise what it is so that you can do something about it. You want to feed your nutritional needs, the things that you actually need for health, and don't feed your appetite or the things that particularly give you pleasure. It will bring you pleasure with time by eating healthy foods, but it will take some time. And the other thing is when you're making choices every day, just have a look at it and say to yourself, is this going to be good for, for me or is this something that's just going to feed my cravings? So closely linked to that is that look at this as a change for your health rather than a weight loss diet. So this is something that's going to, you're going to implement for the rest of your life. So don't make weight loss the goal, make health your goal. So if you can change your mindset there and think about it that way. Lifestyle is a change for life and not a fad diet. It's not something that you need to do for three or four months, it's something that you need to implement and you can do it in stages but something that you need to do for the rest of your life. Okay, So look at it as a lifestyle change, a permanent lifestyle change and not a diet. It's a long term thing, it is not a quick fix and I'll go over some of the quick fix options and why they don't work in a minute. Always focus on the successes that you're having today. Don't look back at the things that you failed at that will not drive you in the right direction. So focus on what's happening today. Make small steps that way. And set realistic goals. If it's taking you 15 years to gain the weight, you're not going to lose it in six months, okay? Or even three months, as some people were hoping. Give yourself time and set realistic goals. We shouldn't be trying to lose more than about a half a kilo a week. And certainly you can lose less than that over a long period of time and you're still going to make great gains for your health. Okay, so getting the right long-term diet is not about counting your calories either, but we want one that's going to burn calories the best. The one that's the best way to actually burn off that extra energy. And there's only one diet through all of our research that fits that bill. We're going to hear this over and over again, the whole food plant-based diet. The one that's rich in all those natural fruits and vegetables or your nuts and grains in their natural form as close as possible. So in this diet, you'll get about 80 to 85% of your calories or, the, or in terms of your overall look at that, is going to come from complex carbohydrates and less than 10% protein and fat. And that is healthy. So it will change the way your body uses energy. 
So you'll be consuming as much as you want, but you'll be utilising that energy a lot better. So more calories will be used up throughout the body through body heat or exercise with this type of diet compared to other types of diet. You will be storing less of that energy as body fat, okay? So you'll be using it up. There's basically overall an increase in the fat degradation. So your body will lose a lot more body fat with this particular lifestyle choice. Now you also form a highly specialised type of fat called adipose tissue and this boosts your metabolism so it will start to speed it up and will stop you from putting any excess fat into fat stores and will use it rather to produce heat. So this is a healthy kind of fat that will improve your metabolism. And of course, the most important thing, you don't need at all to count calories. It is purely just adopting the principles of this diet and you don't need to sit there and count your calories at all. This is not a calorie counting lifestyle choice. And the other bonus of all of this is this diet will have all the fibre, all the anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, all the vitamins, all the minerals that you need. You don't need to look for supplements. You don't need to look for any other options. This will do it in and of itself. What we want to avoid are the low carb diets. So this is, these types of diets have been around for decades. They come in a variety of names and a variety of forms, but they're the ones we need to avoid. And that's for, for a number of reasons, but basically these diets, all of them will look at severely limiting your carbohydrate intake, have a lot higher protein and potentially fat in the diet. Um, you will get a lot of rapid weight loss quite quickly but it comes at a cost to your health. So this is not a health diet, it is purely a weight loss diet, but it has consequences. In the short term, and they did a comparison between just a normal low fat kind of Western diet, so they didn't even compare it here to a, a whole food plant-based diet, far more likely to get constipation and lots of effects in the bowel. Some people are even more likely to get diarrhea headaches, muscle cramps, bad breath, generalised weakness and rashes as well. So that's just the short term consequences of using that diet. You also lose a lot of those complex carbohydrates and fibre and minerals and many of those antioxidants. So you're losing a lot of those healthy things in these diets. You won't find them because they're found, those particular things, the fibre, the vitamins and the minerals are predominantly found in the complex carbohydrates part of your diet. Okay, So you're going to lose a lot of those things which are really important to prevent a lot of the chronic diseases that we are aware of. It's very high in saturated fat and cholesterol. So again, increasing your risk of heart disease, increasing your risk of diabetes, increasing your risk of stroke and cancers, dementias, just to name a few. Very high in animal protein, and we learned a little bit about that yesterday in terms of its cancer risk, certainly heart disease as well. The weight loss is never sustained, okay? You cannot stay on this diet as a long-term option because of the damage it does to you and often you have to keep going through cycles to continue with the weight loss. People bounce back from this and often are in a worse position as before. Interestingly, they did actually look at a summary of about 17 studies. So this covered about 270,000 or more subjects. They showed a 31% increase in total deaths when compared to those who were on an unhealthy Western standard American diet just by using these low carb diets. It was worse than the standard American diet. So please don't use low carb, diet, low carb diets as a weight loss method. We have a much safer, a much healthier way to lose weight. The evidence is there, it's in the research, it's irrefutable. So there we go, increases death. So what are some other helpful dietary measures that we can do? So some of these are just basic behavioural things. Eat slowly. Gives time for your brain to recognise that your stomach is full. If you eat quickly, we can often override those signals and, and you fill up over and beyond for where you should be. Chew your food thoroughly. In fact, probably at least 10 times per mouthful. Again, that will slow things down, improve digestion, because the digestion will start in your mouth. So please do that. Don't snack between meals. So research has shown that the more frequently a person eats, the more they tend to gain weight. So try not to snack. There are provisors on that. So somebody who's a diabetic who needs to have those things to maintain sugar, 
completely understand that doesn't apply to them. Um, we also know that if you limit, it, limit the number of meals, you actually get better stamina. It improves your physical endurance. Snacking also increases your risk of bowel cancer. And you increase the number of calories you burn off when you eat them in fewer meals. So it's better for your metabolism to keep your meals to a minimum. So avoid snacking when you can, when you're, when you're looking to lose weight. Have your main meal at breakfast. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Have your main meal then because most of your energy is going to be used with activity through the morning and then into the afternoon. You'll be more alert, you'll be more productive, you'll kickstart your metabolism for the morning, you'll reduce that need or that drive to snack throughout the day. If you go off to work in the morning and you haven't eaten a decent breakfast, you're far more likely to snack. And it also means you won't go to bed with a full stomach and so you'll be sleeping much better as well. Now, I've put fasting on the list here. I don't mean the kind where you go for days and days without food. I'm talking about some simple principles here. It doesn't have to be an arduous or a long period of time. The research is showing that just not eating after 3 p.m. each day is helpful for weight loss. So having a longer period of time between your last meal and breakfast, that's considered a fast. If you don't really have an active lifestyle, that one might be one that you might implement. So have your last meal by about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Drinking water, we've learned a bit about water, but it's vital in your healthcare plan for losing weight. It does have no calories, so that's an important thing. It will not uh, you know, add to any of the issues there, but if you ignore your thirst mechanism, your body will start to resort to hunger as a means to get the fluid in. So make sure you drink fluid, particularly if you're feeling thirsty, but also throughout the day, if you're not a good water drinker, make sure you actually include that at a regular interval throughout the day, and that will help to keep those hunger signals at bay. Now, water itself has been shown to increase the number of calories that your body burns when you're at rest. So even though it doesn't give you calories, it helps you to burn extra calories. So make sure you drink plenty of water. There's been a few studies that show that drinking even just one and a half litres a day showed significant reduction in weight or your body mass index, your waist circumference and your body fat in as little as three weeks in, overnight individual, in overweight individuals. So water alone was a great weight loss option for them. So drink between your meals. Try not to drink with your meals. It can impede your digestion of that food a little bit, so try and drink between them. And there's your recipe, which I mentioned before. For most people, it's about 30 meals per kilo per day. If you're active, then you would push that up to about 40 meals per kilo per day. Avoid alcohol. Alcohol is your enemy if you're trying to lose weight. There is no nutrient value in alcohol whatsoever. There is no need to have it. It will give you no nutritional benefit, no vitamins, no minerals, nothing there that will help you. Gram for gram, it's almost double the calories of sugar, okay? So it's very, very, very uh, energy dense. It actually stops your body from burning fat. So if you really want to get rid of some, then don't use alcohol. It also stimulates hunger, interestingly. So it stimulates those hunger sensations and it also reduces the feeling of feeling full. So that sense of satiety that we call. It also causes people to make poorer food choices, so they're more likely to go for processed foods, more likely to go for the fatty, sugary foods. So exercise, absolutely essential in your lifestyle, as you've heard already. So what really helps with weight loss? Let's have some look at some of those. Now, aerobic exercise. So this is the stuff that burns calories and reduces body fat, we, and that's the stuff that makes you huff and puff. It gets your heart rate really going. We need about three to five hours per week, so that will equate to about half an hour or more or so a day. So you can push it up a little bit if you've already started, but you haven't started to lose the weight yet. That's one type of exercise, but there is another really important one when it comes to weight loss, and that's resistance type of exercise. So here you're doing little weights. It doesn't have to be big weight lifting, just small weights, resistant bands, those sorts of things. Building muscle mass is really, really important for weight loss. The more muscle mass that you have, 
the better your metabolism, okay? You will burn a lot more energy, a lot more calories, even when you're at rest. If you have a good amount of muscle, you will burn calories even when you're at rest. So it is far more metabolically active than fat is. So it is really important that we look at that to try and build up our muscles. Now, I would recommend if, you, if you've got a regular exercise program that you try at least two sessions a week, two to three sessions a week of resistance type exercise. And we also know that exercise, believe it or not, it, you might think it actually stimulates your appetite, it actually suppresses it. So it's a really good one to include. What about a good night's sleep? What on earth has that got to do with weight loss? A lot, actually. We need at least seven hours a night, apparently. Analysis of about 20 studies, they looked at over 300,000 people. 41% increased obesity risk among adults who had slept less than seven hours a night. So seven hours is sort of the magic number there. If you're not getting a good night's sleep, there's a couple of hormones that are at play here. You will have lower daytime levels of a hormone called leptin. Now this hormone makes you feel full. And you also have higher levels of, a, of another hormone called ghrelin, which makes you feel hungry. So if you have a great night's sleep, you're going to increase your leptin, so you won't feel as hungry, you won't, and of course decrease your ghrelin as well. So these are just in terms of the hormones that can interfere with our feelings of needing food and food-seeking behaviours. And what is interesting, again, they did a study on this, and they showed that just reducing the hours of sleep in men and women down to four hours, these individuals started seeking out and consuming more than 1,200 extra kilojoules each day extra on top of their usual daily intake. And interestingly, they didn't seek out healthy foods, they sought out the unhealthy foods. So they were consuming more calories and more kilojoules, and obviously the bad type as well. So the studies have supported that. We know that if you haven't slept well, you're not gonna have as good self-control, so your decision-making abilities, of course, and the choices that you make are not gonna be there. So better self-control, better food choices with having a good night's sleep. It also prevents that late night snacking, the thing that we know that also contributes, contributes to weight loss, uh, weight gain quite significantly as well. So there's some things that having a good night's sleep is helpful for in our lifestyle and our weight loss lifestyle program. Now sunlight, you might be wondering what on earth that has to do with it. And I must admit, I was rather surprised by the research on this. Under our skin, we do have a layer of what we call subcutaneous fat, which can interfere with our metabolism, plays quite a significant role there. There is some bad kind of fat that can sit under there when we've, we've stored a little too much. Um, and we know that we need to burn that, and it's going to it obviously contribute to obesity, heart disease, etc. But there was a study that they did in Canada, and they found that the sunlight's blue wavelength the light that we can sort of see with our eye, penetrates the skin and reaches the fat cells under there and the little lipid droplets reduced in size. It's almost like they were melting away. So sunlight itself helped with the fat loss or the weight loss there as well. So in other words, our cells won't store as much fat, so get some healthy sunlight. The blue light's much more intense in the morning, so you can certainly get out and get some extra sunlight to help burn off some of the extra bad fat. Now, dealing with plateaus, what do I mean by that? So if you've ever been on any sort of weight loss program or you've made lifestyle changes, you will find that you may lose a bit and then you'll plateau. And it's really quite disheartening for a lot of people, but it's an entirely normal thing to happen. In fact, some people will plateau even when they start before they start to lose weight. And it's basically your body's way of trying to signal that, uh-oh, we're getting con you know, restrictions here, we better, you know, drop our metabolism back so we don't start to lose weight. It's a protective mechanism there. But in the long run, it realises there's healthy choices and you will start to lose weight. So it is normal, expect it, but there are some things that you may like, might like to do if it's going along for too long and you're getting a bit disheartened. Increase or vary the type of exercise that you're doing. So if you're only doing half an hour a day, push it up an extra 10 minutes. If you're doing the same thing every day, then maybe it's just your metabolism's dropped to that point where it's just focusing on that type of exercise. Change your exercise, do something different. If you're used to walking, do a cycling thing or swimming or something of that nature. 
to go for a short fasting period. Now, again, I've talked to you before about maybe going back to a two-day a meal, a two two meal a day plan and having a sort of a 16 hour fast overnight. So it doesn't have to be days of fasting, but just having a longer period overnight where you're not eating food. And you really only have to do that for a couple of weeks. Maybe you'd like to try eating raw foods. Now I don't normally support a raw food diet because lots of our, our vegetables need to be cooked and some of our foods should be cooked. But for the purposes of a plateau, you might like to try just raw foods just for a short period of time, one to two weeks, and that often can reset things to go more into the weight loss again as well. But of course, it is to be expected, and to be patient, it will pass. And that's the end of my talk on weight loss. Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, we'll just wait for the microphone. When it comes to bread yes. and weight loss, is there a difference between eating your whole grain breads to gluten-free? Yeah, so in, it's probably a lot harder these days to get a decent gluten-free bread that's nicely whole grain. Um, obviously, that they're very limited with how they can make the bread, obviously, in the nature of the, the wheat gluten versus the, the products of the other grains. So I, if you are doing it, I mean, we do have to take that into account. If you're not gluten-free, obviously you've got a great range of nice wholemeal, whole grain breads, but I, I can't really recommend any particular brands. There are a few gluten-free breads out there that do contain grains and do have a, a, few, a bit more of the whole meal type uh, grain in them. You just have to do your research. You just have to read the packets. But it is true, gluten-free breads often do have a lot more processed foods in it compared to the, to the healthy gluten-based or wheat-based breads. Yeah, absolutely. So spelt is still considered a gluten-based grain, so it wouldn't be any good for someone who's a celiac. Um, certainly if you have a gluten intolerance and not a gluten allergy, some of them will tolerate spelt a bit better than they will tolerate, of course, a wheat bread. Yeah. Um, enzymes and the way the body uses enzymes to do to deal with proteins. Um, are there any proteins that the en our, uh, enzymes which we produce naturally uh, that the body can't deal with? And if it can't deal with that protein, what does it actually do with that particular fat? Off the top of my head, I don't know any particular proteins found in, in plant-based foods that we can't deal with. So, yeah, if there's, if there's something specifically you're talking about or... In dairy products, there's mm -hmm. a protein called whey. Yes. Uh, and uh, I've, I've heard and I've read myself where in dairy products, if you eat a high quantity of dairy products and whey being in that dairy product, that the body doesn't know what to do with it as a protein. And if we eat too much of it, it just stores it as fat. Yeah, oh, look, I, I probably don't know too much about the metabolism of whey in and of itself, but I do know that animal proteins in general are a lot more stressful on the body in terms of metabolism overall. So, for instance, um, one of the things that we find, particularly for people who have kidney disease, they do far better on a complete plant-based diet because their kidneys can handle plant-based proteins where they can't handle a lot of the animal-based proteins that you would find, for instance, in milk, which would include whey, casein, those sorts of things. Yeah. The reason why I ask that is um, I suffer from allergies and this is probably the worst time of the year coming up with hay fever. I won't be the only one, but mm. uh, I found that uh, having uh, reduced quite substantially the dairy products, it has actually helped my respiratory. And when I do get the onset of hay fever, it, it doesn't last as long. Um, even though I need to take uh, uh, a Zyrtex or something yeah. to, yep. to deal with it, but it's not as 
prolonged and not as aggressive. Yeah, and I, look, there may be an indirect effect. A, a lot of uh, physicians um, would disagree that there's such a thing as dairy causing hay fever or you know, eczema, asthma, those sorts of things. But if you think about the concept that you're having a food that is harder to digest, you're having something that is causing a bit more inflammation. If your body's already sort of a low-grade inflammation, of course your allergies are going to be a lot worse, whatever they might be, whether it is hay fever or other types of allergies. So even though they say there's no direct, there certainly is an indirect. And I have seen that a fair bit even with children who are struggling with hay fever and you know, eczema and things like that, if you take the dairy out of their diet or at least reduce it significantly, they will improve a lot. So clearly, clearly, even though they, there's no direct allergy, maybe there's an inflammatory response that it's um, helping with. So, yeah. Just over here. Further forward? Yeah, yeah okay. I just wanted to ask, um, as we age, our metabolism slows down. Are there any foods that can help to increase our metabolism, metabolic rate? Sorry. Yes. Pretty much the entire whole food, plant-based diet will do that. You will improve the way you actually metabolise food. So you actually increase the number of calories that you can burn, all those sorts of things. So the whole food, plant-based diet across that kingdom... Across that particular diet, all of them will do that. So it's about reducing, obviously, taking out the animal products and just using plant-based products. It does improve your metabolism. It does speed it up, for sure. But, yeah, not specific foods, though. compared to fast fasting? Yeah, so a type of detox that you're wanting to ask about or just normally, generally speaking? Normally what they advertise, you know, to go on a detox for about three or four days, it's probably, you know, what you get from the chemist and that sort of thing. Yeah, so just, there, there, look, there's, yeah, there's a lot of products out there for detoxing and, and look, some of them are actually quite helpful. They, they target the liver in terms of improving its function, its ability to, to do its job. Um, now, they usually, with that will come some supplements and things like that. I don't usually recommend that per se, um, but I have no problem with using detox methods for a few days, but not for a long-term period. So that will usually require a lot more fluids, maybe juices, soups and things like that. So you'll still get plenty of nutrients. Um, but yes, it's not a long-term solution. It's just usually a short-term period. Yeah. But yeah, anything that targets the liver with detox is a good thing. Okay, fantastic. I think I'll leave it to you. Okay. One more question. Okay. Um, usually have a lot of herbs and supplements for other conditions. Just wondering if you have like some for weight loss or weight management. Yeah, because no. like I mean, there like apple cider vinegar, like peels, and then there are other herbs that I have heard of. Yes. Um, no, I don't. I don't. For, for weight loss, it is just purely a lifestyle program. And it's, yeah, there, there are things that I can use specifically, for instance, if someone's a diabetic or if someone's got high cholesterol or high blood pressure, I might throw in some herbs to help with those sorts of things, but not specifically for weight loss. There's been a few mentioned out there in terms of herbs that can help with weight loss, but the science is not good behind them. So lifestyle, definitely good science behind that one. Thank you, Dr. Rachel, for this message. I don't know what you see when you look at the mirror. When I look at the mirror, I see that there is a person who needs some, to do some changes. <laughs> Not just diet, but looks like whole lifestyle. And it can help. Is anyone who like, anyone here who like this uh, message tonight? Anyone? Okay. I'd like to ask you something. If you like, tomorrow, I am spe especially interested in... Uh, second topic which is sleeping and restoration that's exactly what i need to hear so if you know anyone there is this city is full of, full of people who need to hear those uh, uh information so don't stay at home just be lazy go and ask your um, family members your neighbors call them so they can hear that if they can come 
share with them our YouTube channel so they can watch us online. This is also a good method of uh, learning, even if you're not present here in this room. Um, at the end of this uh, topic, I'd like to ask you, and we can pray, we can pray also for mental strength. If you tried to lose your weight, and if you try to change your um, lifestyle, then you find out that you need a lot of that mental strength to do that. That's, that's what I'm dealing at the moment. So maybe we can, we can pray together for that. And we, we can pray for people who are not here with us. So maybe God prepares some people who need to hear those messages. And he will send us tomorrow. And if you have opportunity, use it and share this. At exit, you can, you can take some of those very nice invitations. And there are also old topics. And call your friends, your family, your, your neighbors. I'd like to ask you at the end to stand and I'll, send, I'll ask her. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us Dr. Rachel and her family. And we are asking for special blessing tonight for them. Thank you for all those uh, treasure we hear and help us to implement all those things in our life. Lord, this city is full of people who need to hear this health message and please use us as your tool so we can reach them, we can call them and they can come and maybe change not just lifestyle but also have internal life. We are asking for your blessing for everyone here present in this room, all, also for all people who watch us on YouTube and keep us safe tonight and help us to come tomorrow and learn something more about our lifestyle and changes we need to implement in our lives. We are asking all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. This is all for tonight, and I hope to see you tomorrow in bigger number with someone else here. <laughs>